Uh, I'm uh, David Houston of the University of California at Berkeley, and I have with me today uh, Emeritus Professor Oscar Spate of the Australian National University in Canberra. And I'd like to ask you first, uh, Oscar, uh, your life has spanned uh, very many different experiences, and you were at Cambridge uh, before the war, yeah. and we're interested in geography and its history and so on. Can you give us some uh, um, impressions of Cambridge geography and Cambridge, if you like, before the war? come to mind? Well, I got interested in geography at age of eight, when my mother offered me as a birthday present either an illustrated geography book, big one, or an illustrated history book, and there are more pictures in geography, so that settled that. And so uh, when I went to Cambridge, I took an English um, tripos first, and I owe a lot to that, and then I took the two parts of geography tripos, because um, that had become my leading interest, and also I had one of the best geography teachers there's ever been, I think, Leonard Suggett, yes. at my school. So um, I plunged in. Uh, geography at Cambridge, well, we thought, and I think we were right, that we were just about the re leading school in the country. Um, there's an elan about the place, a very large due to Professor Frank Debenham, who was an Australian, uh, who, as an academic geographer, uh, was rather amateur, perhaps, but was a splendid person to have a, run a field together, a team together, and uh, in early stages, that's much more important, I think, than just technical skill. Um, one could, there's a general part one introduction and for part two, you specialised in one of four, uh, geomorphology, uh, surveying and cartography, uh, historical geography and economic geography. Well, I took geomorphology because I lived on the edges of the wheel when I was a schoolboy, and if you're not going to be interested in geomorphology there, you never will be. And. Um, then historical geography, because I was a young Marxist at the time, mm -hmm. and I thought that all needs for well, economic geography is newspapers plus Marxism, mm -hmm. and so uh, historical geography, because of course my interests have always have been strongly historical as well. Well, um, historical geography in Cambridge is not normally regarded as, at least until uh, recently, as Marxist, and it probably wasn't then. Darby is not Marxist. Uh, oh, it certainly wasn't. No. <laughs> I was. But you were, yes, that's right. <laughs> Uh, which it cost me some, um, I remember answering one paper question absolutely brilliantly. <laughs> All that was wrong was every single fact in it. But the argument itself was beautifully conducted out of Engels, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. <laughs> and I reckon that anyhow they would never have read Engels. <laughs> Well, Steers was also uh, influential on you. Uh, didn't you Didn't you pay some tribute to him in your India book? Or? Well, he was a very close yeah. friend of mine yes. for many years. In the same college. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, what about coming back to Marxism there? Because, you know, there's all this stuff now that we hear about, you know, Kim Philby and uh, uh, Anthony Blunt and so on and so forth, you know, and, and Cambridge Marxism leading to spies and this sort of thing. What's your sort of comment on that, just marginally? Well, I can remember Kim mm. Philby, uh, not Kim Philby, um, Burgess? Philby, uh, Burgess and yeah. McLean. Yeah. Yeah. Burgess and McLean. Did you know them? Uh, oh. I knew mm. them, but our, mm. our uh, relations were not those of perfect friendship. Mm -hmm. They had a wonderful cover. They did it so <laughs> wonderfully that we, in the Labour Club, who thought we were the true communists, uh, thought that they were social fascists. Yes. So that was a splendid cover. Yes. But you can understand that our relations were not so close as uh, some people <laughs> would now like to think yeah. theirs were. Yeah. Um, well, perhaps we'll leave Cambridge. There. We've got a great deal of ground to, to cover. I know that quite soon uh, you went to um, um, out to Burma, yes. didn't you? Uh, it was just before the war, wasn't it? And you were caught in the war. Uh, yes, like it was 1937 uh, yeah. I yeah. went out. Yeah. I think the real answer to that was that Frank Debenham thought that um, I'd mellow down and become a Tory if I went overseas. So I left my country for my country's good. 
<laughs> and ultimately for mine, but there's a lot, a lot before it was alt. Yes. Well, what were you doing in Burma then? You were actually oh, lecturing geography yes. at the University of Rangoon. Yes. And also writing about uh, it, presumably. Well, uh, as much as I could. Yes. It wasn't yes. very much that one could do. Yes. But then you were caught by the war. Right? Yes. And uh, wounded. Uh, yes. First air raid on Rangoon. Yes. Mm -hmm. I may have been the first officer casualty. I was certainly the second, <laughs> if not the first. In the whole Pacific War? Uh, no, in the Burma campaign, the Burma only, of campaign, course. Yes, yes. Um, and what happened then? Uh, well, I uh, spent a considerable amount of time in hospital yes. and came out and um, had to find mm. a job. I didn't want to be a railway transport officer at Tonga Wallapur or somewhere like that. So I uh, managed to get into the, um, I've forgotten, Directors of Publicity, I think it was mm. called, mm. as um, military press censor, i.e. the very opposite of publicity. And um, that was a very interesting experience. It had some very amusing sides to it, but it um, was a bit negative, and after years I got tired. Mm. In the meantime, two friends from the university, the professor of biology and the senior lecturer in English, had got into the inter-service topographical department and were engaged in writing up the geography of Burma. Somehow they pulled strings, so I got into the one job for which I think I was the absolutely round peg in the round hole. Um, very unusual, it's sort of been a court of inquiry. Yes. But, um, so I found myself in the charge of preparing uh, topographical departs on the whole of Burma, mm -hmm. and um, I still got one of them, probably illicitly, and uh, had we written to standard form and so on, but even then, I managed to get in a grain of humour some once right. or twice. Yes. Well, when I first remember um, hearing you, not exactly meeting you, was when I was an undergraduate in Oxford and had been in India myself, mm -hmm. very young, but I heard you talk about the partition. And that was very exciting to me at that time as an undergraduate. And I wondered if you'd like to talk about a little about what, you would, what your impression of that period was and the partition. Well... Yeah. It was very agitated. I was acting as advisor to the Ahmadiyya uh, Muslim group, sect, denomination, whatever you like to call. And um, it was extremely hot. Um, the arguments were perfect, completely legalistic. Um, geographically, neither side had a clue about, what, about mm -hmm. how you should draw a bound mm -hmm. boundary. Uh, and although I don't think it had the slightest influence <laughs> on events at all... You didn't. I don't think so. Uh, yeah. um, but you reported it pretty well, I remember. Well, that's yeah. different. Yes. Uh, but certainly it yes. was an extremely interesting yes. experience, and I was a fly on the wall, as it were. Yes. And um, it certainly stood me in good stead, because, mm -hmm. of course, the article I wrote, or two or three articles I wrote about it at the time, were, um, well front-line stuff, or yes, less exactly. a scoop from yes. a geographical point yes. of view. Yes, right. Well, uh, the next uh, time that I, I personally met you was at LSE when I was a graduate student, mm -hmm. but very briefly, because you were only there a very short time. That was a very short interlude at the London School of Economics, was it for oh, you? four years. Four years, yes. But was that anything to say about that? In terms of your former formation or whatever? Well, I um, certainly enjoyed Mm. London School of Economics. Yes. It was very hard work. It was very austere yes. just after the war. Yes. Rationing still on. Yes. And um, we had to do evening lecturing on the same subjects, same, mm -hmm. same lectures, sometimes in the evening and so on. And uh, that was considerable strain on yes. one, of course. Yes. But um, it was very useful. And Dudley Stamp, of course, was very useful to me. I uh, misjudged him once. He invited me to a party, and he, I, I knew that he knew I'd already contracted to write a geography of India, and I thought that he probably wanted to offer joint authorship. <laughs> well, I knew what that would mean, <laughs> who would do most of the work and whose name would come first on the title page, and resolved to assist that at all costs. Um, 
However, he didn't. He really wanted to kidnap me from Bedford College for Women, which was very kind to give me a, a sort of interim job just to get back into the civilian mm. life again. Mm. That's yes. not what they meant it for, but that's yes. what it was. Yes. Yeah, I, I have a, a memory of you with a, with a, a stubbly chin, uh, having been working all night on that book on uh, India. You won't remember. I mean, that, that was true that you did. You worked very hard on India book while you were in... Uh, in um, well, NC, did you? Didn't you? Yes, indeed. Yes. I mean, mm. there came a point where I realised that um, after I accepted an appointment to ARU, mm. realised something I really had to get the thing finished. Yes. Yes. I remember one night I worked till about four or five, and then decided mm -hmm. it wasn't worthwhile trying to go home. Anyhow, there weren't, probably weren't any trains running, so I curled up in the uh, sofa in the. Yes big common room there and was very kindly awakened by one of the porters with a cup of tea. Yes. <laughs> but those are, I could do it. That's when yes. you're young, you can do this yes, sort of thing. Right. But that was a very magnum opus, uh, that, uh, that book, which is still, still running, I think. But, of course, you changed gears very much after yes. that, and we can perhaps... Well, I wish yes, it wasn't yes. still running, because oh. it is mm -hmm. so very mm -hmm. out of date, mm -hmm. and I don't think you could redo it, revise it, I think it needs a completely yeah. new book, yeah. and I'm very sorry <laughs> that it was reprinted a little while ago in mm. India. Mm. Uh, it hasn't outlived its usefulness, I think, in a no, way, no. because I think uh, that at some future date, if you're going to compile a little library of books which showed what India was like right. in the 1950s, right. it yes. would have to be one yes. of them. <laughs> I'll say, I'll say, yes. Well, then, uh, to moving on rather swiftly, I mean, you, you've now lived, I suppose, about half your life in Australia, nearly, is that right? Uh, yes, just about yes, half. Yes, right. Well, I wanted to shift, I mean, the, uh, that um, you came here to Australia, and we're doing this in Sydney, uh, about um, 1951, as the first professor of geography at the newly founded uh, Australian National yes. University. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to uh, ask for your thoughts on both on your impressions <coughs> of Australia, um, which presumably you hadn't visited before, and later on about the ANU. But first, Australia, how did it strike you coming here 40 years ago almost? Well, I'd read about it, I lectured about it, and I knew it factually, but I hadn't really felt till I got here how empty the continent was mm -hmm. once you got outside the suburbs of um, Sydney and Melbourne and so on. Um, hit you almost physically. Um, it was incredibly unsophisticated mm -hmm. compared to what it is today. There had been a vast revolution in Australian life since I came here. Uh, it was fresh, fresher and franker than life in England was, mm -hmm. but it was also a damn sight flatter and less colour, more mon monotone. Don't yes. say monotonous, but monotone. Mm -hmm. Monotone in a sort of ethnic way, you mean? No, British, it, well, or, cultural, or, yeah. culturally. Yeah, it, was, um, it was the um, manners and mores of, of the middling standard, as Keith Hancock, who just yes. died, yes. called it. Yes. Uh, so, did that depress you, uh, coming straight from England, then? And well, uh, this is something that mm. a lot of Australians will think is an extreme paradox. Mm. But it wasn't, I think. I think it would have done if I'd lived mm. in Sydney or Melbourne. Mm. But living in Canberra, yes. one was much more in touch with the countryside. Mm. I remember I could drive 15 miles from my door to my door to four distinct types of country, and for 12 of those miles, I would not see a house. Yeah. And of course, um, Canberra was very small, yes. 28,000 people, 30,000, 40,000 a bit yes. later, and uh, before TV, and one had to do one's own entertainment, and mm -hmm. repertory theater and various other things like that were very nice and active. Yes. And um, I even played uh, Faust in a reading of yes. Goethe's Faust once. Mm -hmm. A very agreeable marguerite too. Yes. Well, I, I seem to remember uh, visiting you, I think it was 1962, 
and you complained about the lake that was going to flood your outlook um, uh, below your house. Mm -hmm. you, you, you looked upon it uh, with disdain, the, the future lake. What do you feel about Oh, that was Canberra one of my now? mistakes. Yes, I see. Um, I thought it was so delightful. One could lie in bed in the heart of the national capital and hear the cattle, the cows in the uh, little dairy farm on the flats below. And I thought with the three national industries, racing, golf and dairying in that <laughs> order, occupying the floodplain, that we were safe. Oh. And um, I thought it would be a sort of great cultural divide running through the middle of Canberra. Mm -hmm. Well, it does. There's yes. north side and south side. I'm firmly north side. Mm -hmm. But um, all the same, it's, a, it's very beautiful and makes a wonderful... Um, yes. You can't call something that runs through the middle a setting, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, you see what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, then, this was also the, um, the founding and the birth of the Australian National University that you were in on, presumably. Yeah. And since this is um, generally regarded as rather unique in the, in the world, I think, as an academic institution, I'd li and since you've been there for nearly 40 years, I'd like to get your um, candid impressions about the place and also perhaps maybe spike the guns, if you like, of some of the criticisms that are made of it, which, for instance, of elitism and so on, you see. But I don't want to um, mm. beg the question. Well, in my experience, people who complain most bitterly of elitism are really self-appointed or disappointed elitists mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, it is a penetrative word, or can be, but in itself, mm -hmm. I don't think any nation, group, institution has got on or can exist without something of an elite. What makes the difference is whether that elite is open and accessible to outside influences, mm -hmm. outside opinion, mm -hmm. uh, infiltration, whether it mm -hmm. renews itself. Well, from that point of view, the ANU in the early days was absolutely splendid. Mm -hmm. It was, um, we all knew it was a new thing. And uh, because it was a new thing, it's why Many of us were attracted to it, and um, it gave one an elan, a sort of terrific morale. The place was too small for the bureaucracy to get its clutches really in, and we, our bureaucrats um, were very much part of ourselves, as it were, and um, we had to do a good deal of the bureaucratizing ourselves, as a matter of fact. And um, it was it was very good. I can remember when one tea room held practically all the academic people, including even Professor Titterton from, from physics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that really yes. is a long time yes. ago. Yes. It's well, enormous what, now, too. What big. would you say was the rationale for such a, a very unusual institution as ANU? And what was it meant to revivify uh, uh, the rest of the country and sort of eventually? finish its work because every, every, everywhere else had been sort of fertilized or what? Um, well, the word term brain drain had not been invented in those days, but certainly one factor mm. in the establishment of ANU yes. was an attempt to reverse the brain drain, yes, so yes. Brain drain of mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. academics, scientists in particular, uh, but academics in general, uh, to United Kingdom or the United States. Mm -hmm. And it was, to some extent, I think remarkably mm -hmm. successful in that, mm -hmm. with the people like Oliphant, for example, mm -hmm. yeah. um, returning, and um, John Eccles, and um, Frank Fenner. So, I quote scientists, because <laughs> I think yeah. the uh, humanity side, um, well, Keith Hancock was the big name to come yes. back. Mm -hmm. Where did he come back from, actually? Oh, England, was it? He was the uh, Institute of Commonwealth Studies in yes, London, London. Yes, when, when he was appointed. Yes. Did this happen in, in geography, which we should perhaps move on to now, since this is what we're talking about? Well, it didn't uh, happen in geography, uh, because there, were, the, there weren't any. There were no eminent Australian yes. geographers abroad, except Griffith Taylor, yes. and he'd made Australia mm -hmm. a little bit too hot to hold him. Mm -hmm. And um, 
it really was very much starting from scratch. Yeah. The McDonald's Holmes at Sydney, well, I think, mm -hmm. if I say he is rather idiosyncratic mm -hmm. geographer, I think it would probably be better to leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. certainly uh, the <laughs> idea that there would be another star in the sky appealed largely to those people who are trying to keep the thing going in, mm -hmm. in uh, the other universities. But when I came in 1951, there were precisely six yes. full-time geographers in fully recognized mm -hmm. geography departments, mm -hmm. and then a handful of part-time and all the rest of it. That's yes, amazing. Mm. And now there'd be two of them, probably. Uh, there were, I was the second professor that, in the country, after MacDonald Holmes and, of course, Griff Taylor before him. Um, by 1970, there are 20 professors and 240 lecturers mm -hmm. and above. Yes. Well, now, your terms of reference there, um, as part of the Research School of Pacific Studies, mm -hmm. didn't really uh, cover Australia much, did it? It was... It depends what yeah. um, discipline you're yes, in. Yeah. Um, in geography, for instance. Mm -hmm. Well, it was pretty yeah. optional. Mm -hmm. uh, we had quite a lot of work in certainly in Australia to begin with, mm -hmm. and uh, some, in, some in New Guinea and uh, other uh, Pacific Islands. Mm -hmm. No, on the whole, I think in the first years, at any rate, we kept quite a nice balance between uh, Australia and Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, some disciplines, because of their uh, subject matter, would let one, one way and, and some the other, but there's a great deal um, on both sides of, um, well, it isn't a fence, but uh, both wings of the subject, as it were, mm -hmm. both the Australian and the Pacific Islands one. Yes. And, and that's subsequently extended into Asia uh, somewhat, hasn't it? Yes. Um, um, Southeast Asia Southeast, in particular, yes. we've got, um, well, we're very strong in some departments, mm -hmm. economics, for example, yes. uh, particularly strong on... Um, on uh, Indonesia. Mm -hmm. yes. And this also is one of the uh, factors in the foundation of the ANU, uh, the desire to have um, a pool of accessible information mm -hmm. about um, mm -hmm. our nearest Asian yes. countries. Yes. Would it be true to say that uh, the sort of main um, corporate contribution is the work done on, say, New Guinea, Fiji, the islands to the north? Um, um, say in geography, that is. No. In geography. Mm. Well, no, because oh. I think um, what you might call the tooling up of geography in Australia, uh, we've done a good deal in that. Mm. Um, incidentally, I'd like to say right here and now, mm. the fact that this expansion of geography <laughs> in Australia um, came after um, the foundation of geography in ANU, is not a case of post hoc ergo propter hoc. Mm. It would have happened anyhow. You uh, said I, the suspension of geography, did you say? Expansion. Oh, expansion, I'm sorry. 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 I must apologize. Yes. You're not, um, yes, I see. Yeah, um, it would have happened anyhow. Yes. We, we did help in some ways. Right. Well, now I'd just like to, I know that you yourself have done, done work on Fiji. Mm. Um, and, um, of course, it's a, uh, coming um, into a rather difficult situation now in Fiji, and you, I don't get you to talk about that, but your work on Fiji was quite an important um, part of your life, wasn't it? It was a very important mm. part of my life, yeah. and um, whether it's <laughs> important in the life of Fiji is another question. That sort of it's question you'll still, never know until, until you're up there It's tonight. still talked about. I was in Suva about 10 days ago. Mm. And it is. But anyway, I, I would like to now, since there's not much time really, to ask for your sort of retrospective opinions. I know that you've been, in a way, out of geography, both as director of the school and Pacific history for some time, but this is geography that we're concerned yeah. with here. And you've had a great influence on geography one way or another around the world various countries, and I would like to ask you, well, for, for instance, first of all, you mentioned Griffith Taylor. Yeah. What's your opinion about his philosophy, his achievement? Well, for instance, it was 
in a sense, it's a very simplistic approach mm. of mm. questions of environment and that, mm. but all the same, the possibilists and so on uh, said that the environment didn't really make much difference, mm -hmm. and uh, so the Geoffrey wasn't really didn't have very much to say, and then complained when people um, paid no attention, when it had passively yes. admitted that he had nothing mm -hmm. much to say. Yes. Well, Griff Taylor would never have admitted he had not much to say, <laughs> <laughs> putting it mildly, mm -hmm. and. Um, he was a saber, not um, a saber, not a not a, a not a rapier, mm -hmm. and um, he certainly had a tremendous impact. Uh, it could not last because, let's put it this way, he had a very vigorous and bold mind, mm -hmm. but not, I think, really a subtle mind. Mm -hmm. Yes, and with yes. increasing sophistication of techniques. Mm -hmm. Um, it really didn't. It, it didn't last. All the same, uh, he did make people sit up and take notice of our job. Yeah. So much yeah. so that they told him to leave the country, practically. Yes, right. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and he. It looks as, as if he'll be spot on with respect to his population forecast for the end of this century in Australia. Just about. Just about. And they'll live just where he said they would. Yes. So that is that. Is that good luck or good management? Okay. Oh, I think, well, I, mean, it's, I think it's just common sense if you yes. look what the continent of Australia is yes, like. Right. But it was completely at variance with what uh, most people probably uh, thought. Of that. Well, a lot of people in the boosting oh, days, yes. the 20s and so on, did a simple rule of three sum. Mm -hmm. The United States is three million yes. square miles, Australia is three million square miles, the United States had whatever it was, 160 million people, so why Australia should? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, at least if you say Griff Taylor was simplistic, he wasn't that simplistic. No, was no, he? no, no. <laughs> well, um, you you also wrote, um, I think, a very influential uh, paper, although you were sort of deprecating yourself in it on quantity and quality in geography, and of course this has been this argument's been raging for mm. maybe twenty years, but it's really died down now, and I think you've been as much vindicated as anybody, even though you thought you weren't any kind of expert on it. What's your opinion of this sort of dichotomy now? Well, um, as far, you must remember that for the last 20 years, my mind has been elsewhere. Yes, of course. Although I would say about my historical work that I could not have done it as it has been done if I hadn't been a geographer yes. to begin with. Yes. Um, Well, quantity, what really happened was that Bob Smith made me look at the thing mm -hmm. and I suddenly realised I was completely inadequately trained to deal, <laughs> deal with this thing and it's too late to start going back to school and learning algebra and so on. And uh, this is an attempt to sort of work the thing out of my system. Uh, I don't think I was obscurantist. After all, I did recruit Bob Smith who went on to much greater things right. after that and yes. so... Uh, I couldn't, I think, be accused of having attempted to stifle something mm. because it threatened me. Oh. But I, I knew it did threaten me. Mm. And um, it would have been different in a teaching university where there had been a, some core subjects I could still cope with. Um, but with the university of liberal um, scholarship policy, so you got the best and brightest students, and of course they would be on the leading edge, mm it very soon found that I couldn't understand more than about 20% of what the boys were up to. And this is not a mm. good position. Mm. Uh, they would have seen through me sooner or later. <laughs> However, my gift of the gab. Yeah. Anyhow, I felt a fraud. Yes. Oh. And if you get out without losing cash or credit, you certainly could, should. Uh, perhaps even without that proviso, you should. Mm -hmm. And I got more cash and credit by becoming a director, so that was splendid. Yes. And then after, I finished being director, it had been silly to go back to the department I'd found in 17 years before in a vastly different climate. The one thing elder statesmen are either non entities or nuisances. Mm -hmm. So uh, I took myself off completely differently yes. to yes. history, which had always yes. been a love of mine. Yes. Well, before I get on to that history, um, which of course is, is your latest chapter, to say the least, um, well, I'd just like to ask you though about the splitting of the department that you had as a unified department in Canberra mm. uh, into physical and human. What's your now your opinion about that? 
Well, I think it has worked. Um, it was uh, it was dicey. To some extent, it went against my uh, mm. feelings, mm -hmm. but both sides were developing a momentum of their own, and if they stayed together, they'd have got in each other's way, I think. And certainly, uh, both the human department has been very successful indeed, I think, and biogeography and geomorphology, um, which owes so very much to Joe Dennings, who yes. died quite recently, yes. uh, I think that also has been a tremendous success mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. So uh, no real regrets about it. I see. And yet, uh, a sort of a cardinal a point about geography, which I'm sure you've mm. subscribed to, is the sort of unity and the interface, as they mm. say, between man and nature, which I think is now coming back in the ANU, too, from what I understand. Well, um, mm. the old determinism we used to argue mm. about in the 30s is as dead as a doornail, mm -hmm. and um, never really... Well, I just leave it as dead as a doornail. But there is a new determinism, which is very potent and terrifying. Mm -hmm. It is the determinism of the cult of bigness in everything, the multinationals, the macro corporations, big business, big armament, big labor sometimes. And above all, I think, the pollution of the environment. Now that may, we say we conquered nature, and what do we do? With every step towards conquering nature, we create another natural problem for ourselves in the way of pollution, soil degradation, and so on. Yes, of course, yes. Well, let, let me, now I have in, I've just picked up a copy of your latest uh, uh, book, the third volume of this uh, magnum opus trilogy on the history of the Pacific, this latest one called pa Paradise Found and Lost. And I would like to ask you uh, how this activity uh, compares in your mind with what you were doing, say, on India. Uh, is it very different, a uh, wholly well, different I, way of proceeding? Let me say that in, in scale, the one is Himalayan and the other is oceanic, so there's no <laughs> difference in scale. And I think that nobody could say that I've been afraid of tackling big things, seeing what my first was and what my last is. Right. Um, no, it's an attempt to see the altogetherness of yes. the thing. Which is very geographical. Isn't yes, it? but at mm. the same time, mm. to find room or interesting, perhaps not always strictly relevant, relevant but stimulating and exciting detail. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to be very human in my human geography, and uh, I have managed to write a book which, um, while it certainly deals with um, global themes such as the inflation of the 16th century and the question of the whole, whole question of the uh, um, Contraction of the uh, uh, conjuncture of the 16th, 17th century, uh, nevertheless finds a name place for individuals, uh, their stories, their quirks, their right. greatnesses, yes. their stupidities, yes. and so on. Right. And in fact, I think just a couple of days ago, I happened to pick up the Sydney Morning Herald. I don't know if you've seen a review of it, of your latest volume in that. But it, it it headed up storyteller. Yes, well, and you, that would you'd be history is story. Yes, I was called by a rather too ardent Frenchman the Herodotus of the South Seas. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote back and said, Her Herodotus certainly told many stories and very good stories, but some of them were stories in mm. inverted commas. <laughs> yes, well, I think I remember. Um, in the, when I was reviewing your second volume, actually comparing you with Brodell, and you also mentioned Brodell mm -hmm. in the forward, I think, of this volume here, uh, Brodell had also been, well, not exactly a geographer, but very much mm -hmm. in the geographical tradition mm -hmm. and influenced by geographers mm -hmm. of the French school. Um, 
So would you say then that you were somehow in the tradition of, let's say, the Anna or school or Brodellian? Well, in that sense? Um, I think I might say I would hope to be in that mm -hmm. tradition. Um, I certainly have very high respect for Annal School, and it does seem to be a, a sort of um, holistic type of thinking. Um, I haven't, of course, got quite their grasp of detail, ah, but then, of course, they had lots of research assistants, and mm. I never have had one. Mm, really, that's interesting, because you're not short of detail, really, in your books. But uh, I would like to, I, I remember introducing you in Berkeley to Carl Sauer, and I'd mm. like to ask you what you thought of him. Well, of course, I have always had a very high regard for mm. Sauer, uh, essentially for the same reasons that I'm a humanist and he is mm. a humanist yes, yes. of a very high order. Right. Yes. Well, is there, um, uh, um, if you had to sort of um, advise young geographers on uh, fertile fields, um, from the, on the basis of your experience, and of course, as partly as a historian, you, I think you've always uh, um, reviewed history and geography as pretty inseparable. But what would you, what would you say about the, the prospect and the validity and the usefulness of these magisterial works on very large regions of the world, as you had so much experience of history or geography? Well. Whatever happens, I think, in some form or other, there will always be regional human geography, mm -hmm. if only for the reason that Strabo said is so useful for kings and commanders. Mm -hmm. yes. And mm -hmm. uh, certainly, <laughs> when I think of the Interstellar Topographical Department, a lot of the work that's done in America, um, you can see this it is needed, this sort of general view not broken down into too yes. much detail, mm -hmm. but above all, not separated out formally, the salt supplies are somewhere other formally yes. separated yes. from the trade in salt. Yes. Well, we've just seen a, a rather masterly one-hour synthesis on the Pacific by Jerry Ward here, your colleague, and it would seem that that was very geographical to me. I don't know if you'd agree. I yeah. thought it was beautiful. Yes. And I take and, uh, credit for the fact that the appealing to him to s see if he could make some inquiries to find whether anyone um, would be interested in coming to the new University of Papua New Guinea. I added at the bottom of the type letter a handwritten bit saying, I don't suppose you would be, would you? And mm -hmm. he was. Yes. So I uh, take that one of the, one, one of the things which St. Peter will give me some credit. Yes. And presumably you also appointed him to the chair in Canberra. That, uh, or um, were you director of the school then? I'm uh, not quite well, certain that that about that. I'm uh, not quite certain because I think I may have been in a. I can't remember no, it the date. Anyway. So it all depends whether I had such and yes. such a position at such and such a mm. time, and I can't remember the dates. Mm. When you were in the um, school um, as a director, mm -hmm. um, did you f did you feel that um, uh, that there was a, a oneness of purpose among the departments that they worked in together interdisciplinarily on their common purpose? Well, it was a remarkably harmonious team. Uh, obviously, a thing ranging from economics to yes. pollen analysis. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you, you can't. Yes. Think of the pollen analysis and the theoretical yes. economists had terribly much to do with each other, but um, they certainly had a very cooperative team. Um, only one person who, in those difficult decisions about whether we could take this scholar or that scholar, uh, made a fuss about accepting <laughs> accepting the sense of the meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, that was that's pretty good from a group of um, eight or nine people. Yes, right. Well, uh, I'd like to um, <clears throat> just ask for your sort of summarizing thoughts on what you think um, the uh, mission of geography is in, in the world, whether you think that um, people, as is often said in America, are just extraordinarily ignorant of the world, and, and, which is true in America, I think, mm -hmm. um, and what you think um, uh, the role of geography uh, is and should be as you've seen it evolving? Well, essentially, it's 
to try to reach and diffuse an understanding of how living in a certain set of physical and cultural conditions affects human life. Now that's a rather not terribly meaningful put in those terms, and yet what other terms can I find? It's a tall order, really, mm. but perhaps, but, mm. um, but you wouldn't see it withering away, presumably. No, it may... Mm -hmm. A few years ago, I, I think mm. I did, but did it you? may take other... Uh, I thought it would always be there, but in different forms, and mm. the regiment be formed under a different flag, <laughs> yes. as it were. But um, there does seem to be in a cycle, and the sort of geography that I um, stood for, I suppose, um, seems to be coming back again. Yes, I think it, it is. Mm. I think it really is, yes. So who would you, who would you put in, in your pantheon um, of geographers um, in the past? Uh, people that you think were good for the subject? Uh, Humboldt, Ray mm -hmm. uh, so it's more difficult after yes. that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, partly because there's so many more practitioners mm. and they did such excellent things, but mm. for types, aspects of subject, I still think that read on Leblat is important, yes. mm -hmm. although I disagree with the s school that he's supposed to represent. Uh, one of the best and neglected one is Camille yes. Vallo. Yes. His little book on political geography, I yes. still think, is one of the best small books on yes. that subject, yes. and that's 1911. Yes, right. Would you still think of yourself, as I think you were once, as uh, something of a political geographer? Oh, yes, mm. well, damn it. <laughs> Put that boundary commission, and that right. isn't political geography, mm. what on earth is? Mm. Well, you, you did a joint book with Gordon East, didn't you? Yes. On? Changing map of Asia, I think it was. Well, that oh. resulted in the one good resolution I have kept. We only had six contributors, three of them from the same university, and avowed after that never again would I edit a cooperative book, and I haven't. Yes, <laughs> yes. Pretty good. Yes, yes, yes. Um. Well, I, th I think that you didn't have anybody else to add then. Um, to, you, to people that you think um, are good role models, to use a dreadful term now, um, um, in geography, since that's what we're concerned with in this sort of series. I could, well, I can, but I think in you mentioned most cases I'd have to qualify yes. a little bit. Reclus was very important in your, um, in your India work, in a way. Oddly. Well, he wasn't important for facts. No, I mean, no, for God's sake, style. 1896. Yes. yes. But for the seeing things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Seeing things. Mm. And the fact that he was a, an anarchist, was that a, a help or um, irrelevant? Or, um, I don't think it was terribly relevant no. to his oh. geographical work. Oh. It comes out in, in some phrases, but then people who are not anarchists might well say that St. Petersburg and uh, Calcutta are the same, mm -hmm. a city of um, palaces set in a swamp yes. of hobbles, or <laughs> yes. words to that effect. Yes. Well, you don't have to be an anarchist mm. to say that. Yes. He, he was, just, just as an, an aside, seemingly quite uh, impervious to the influence of Darwinism, which took over so many people at that time. Uh, yes, uh, that would be interesting mm. to follow mm. up. Yeah. He just didn't seem to be affected mm. or bring it into the way many geographers did at yes. the time. Yes. Into his reasoning. Mm. Yes. Yes. Um, let's say one thing for myself. Uh, my advice to students. Yes. You do not have to be solemn in order to be serious. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I think that's a pretty good note to end on, as a matter of fact, <laughs> that we could go on forever. But thank you very much, Oscar, well, for thank this. Thank you. Class. It's been fun. Right, good.